loud. Okay, so there will be a um, relatively short homework assignment uh, due on Friday. Okay, and the only reason it's due on Friday is you'll see that it is, um, I'm gonna need it in order to prepare for next week's classes, okay? Uh, this is an assignment that we're gonna have from time to time, probably like every three weeks or so, um, which is going to be like this, okay? Uh, Google Forms. You're going to find a translation of Pirkei Avos chapter one. I'm going to put one, uh, a link to the Chabad one on uh, Google Classroom. Um, but um, I personally like Art Scrolls translation better. And if you have Art Scrolls Sitter at home, then you'll find it in the Sitter after Mincha of Shabbos. Probably the Korean Sitter also has it there, but um, you know, because that's when people will tend to read it. Uh, but you know, find a translation, read through the entire chapter in English. Okay, probably is going to be like two or three pages. Um, choose a Mishnah that interests you. Okay. Uh, it doesn't even have to be the entire thing that interests you, just something that catches your eye. And then you're going to fill out a Google form, which has four items. Okay. Item number one is you're going to just tell me the, the chapter and number of the Mishnah. Okay. Um, so you'll see the, the numbered, then you're going to type or copy and paste the English translation of the Mishnah you used into the Google form. And the reason for this is because just like any like Pasuk or anything like that, there's different ways to translate it. And I want to know which translation you were using when you came up with your questions. Third part is you're going to just list questions that you have on the Mishnah. And then the fourth one is you're going to just say, why did you choose the Mishnah? Like what interested you, you know, what, what, what caught your eye. And the purpose of this assignment is basically going to be, you're going to, you're all going to turn this in on Friday. Uh, and then I'm going to choose the Mishnah that got the most votes, so to speak. And then we'll learn that one next week. Okay. And then we'll do the one after that. So the purpose of this is just kind of like to have a democratic way to choose what we're going to be learning. Um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, and that, that'll sustain us for the, uh, the next chapter, week. chapter one have more than seven, like, Pirke about. Does it have more than seven? Did you say? Yeah. It doesn't have more than seven. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So then what if we all choose a different one? Uh, then I weigh in and I choose the one that uh, I'm the time maker. Yeah, <laughs> I get to vote also. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I think this is fairly straightforward. Okay, but any questions? And I, when I say it shouldn't take you more than like 15 minutes because when I say read the entire chapter in English, again, chapters are short and you're basically going to be skimming uh, just looking for something that interests you. I, I do want you to see the whole thing, but yeah. Okay, so intro to Pirke Avos. Okay, um, and this is going to be the overview and guess how we're going to do our intro. Soaps. <laughs> okay, we're going to do a soaps on Pirkei Avos. Before we do this, though, then uh, just some basic info that's not included in the soap stuff. Okay, so the official title is Avos. Okay, alternate titles of the book, or it's not a book. Okay, alternate titles are Pirkei Avos, which they translate as Chapters of the Fathers or Ethics of the Fathers. Um, any guesses as to who we're referring to when we say Avos here? It's, it's uh, I mean, we usually refer to the same office, but any guesses as to, uh, again, I forgot what uh, involvement you've had in Pirkei Avos, but any guesses as to who the Avos are here? Uh, ah, good. Good. What makes you say that? Because that's who the authors are. Ah, good. Okay, good. It's the authors. Good. So um, I found a, or someone pointed me actually to this, um, a, uh, it's, we're not sure if it's actually Rashi, but it's listed as Rashi. Okay. Uh, can someone uh, read? I would say we go around in a circle, but I, I, don't, I don't think I have the same order as you do. So you'll just have to like jump in. Whoever starts, go ahead. If Ayala Thayer is trying to read, I can't hear her. Even though she's not, she's not on mute. Okay. Now you hear me? Got it. Yeah. The Vinikru Yelu Perke Avos, and they, is the English supposed to be there? Yeah, the English is supposed to be there. Is it not? Should I read English? Should you can read, read it in English? Hebrew or English, either way. Okay. And these are called chapters of the fathers because they were arranged here, the words of the early fathers who received the Torah from one another, such as Moshe, Yoshua, the Zikadim, each from one another, until the men of the great assembly and Shama and Hillel, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and his students, and Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi informed us how proper their actions were and how they warned the members of their generation and guided them on their sh on the straight path. Likewise, it is proper for every wise person to warn the people in their generation and to teach them the upright path. Okay, so 
Um, as Emily said, then this is, uh, it's the Zakanium. I mean, when Emily, when you said Zakanium, you really meant like all, everyone, right? Not just like the, the 70 uh, Zakanium. Yeah. Um, so um, this is the, um, uh, it's referring to all of the authors of Pirkei Avos, and they're called Avos here, not because there are forefathers like when we call uh, Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov, uh, but because they are, um, what do you call it? They are the like leaders of the generation. Okay. So, um, oh, and just to show you the way, the structure of it, uh, this is just the first like half of the chapter here. So it starts off, uh, I don't know if you learned this as a, anyone randomly learned this one as a song? I, I forgot if I asked that before. Yeah, okay. Um, so Moshe Kibbal Torah Misinai, Umasari Yoshua, Yoshua Lezakinim, Lezakinim Lenevim, Lenevim Nesarua, Anshe Kness Hagadola. Right, so Moshe received the Torah at Sinai. He gave it over to Yeshua, Yeshua to the Zakanim, the Zakanim to the Nevim, Nevim to the Anshek and And then it lists like each of the individual um, members of who passed it to. So Shimon Atzadik Haya Mishiari Knesset Hagadola. So Shimon Atzadik was one of the last per people in the Anshek Knesset Hagadola. Who Haya Omer? And then it says what he said. Okay, then next. Antinos Ishsocho Kibo Mishimon Atzadik. Antinos got it from Shimon. Who Haya Omer? He would say, etc. Then Yosef ben Yoezer, each straight of Yosef ben Yochan, each Yishlam, Kiblu Mehem. And it goes on and it says who got it from who. Okay, so that's the structure of Pirkei Avos, and it continues like that through most of Pirkei Avos. Okay, so that's why we call it Avos. Um, why is it called Pirkei Avos? Like chapters of the fathers? I have no actual idea. Anyone heard an explanation for why it's called chapters of the fathers? I was trying to research this. So there is a, I have a theory, and this is just a totally a private theory. Um, there, there's a minhag that people have to read one chapter a week between, I think, Pesach and Shavuos, and then some people continue it through the entire summer. So maybe because people were accustomed to read chapters, then um, they, you know, they read it, uh, um, you know, then, then they started calling it chapters. Okay, I, I, I have no idea if that's true or not, but that's my guess. Okay, genre. Okay, what kind of text is Pirkei Avos? I kind of gave a hint when I said it's not a book, okay? So it's not a book, but what is it? A compilation. Okay, it is a compilation. And what specifically, uh, do you know what compilation it was part of? I kind of said this also. The Mishnah. Buddy. The Mishnah, okay, good. So this is part of the Mishnah. And the Masechta is Pirkei Avos. And let's do a review. Uh, this is a review for everyone, but especially my students who had Ohayat and Gemara. What is the Mishnah? I can't see if you're raising your hands. So if you want to just uh, jump in, then you can. It's a, it's the oral law that was passed down orally until Rabbi Yehuda Nasi wrote it down in 200 BC. Nice. Okay, good. And why did he write it down? Because it was in danger of being forgotten. Excellent job, Emily. Okay, good. So uh, this is the first written down Torah Shabal Peh. Uh, compiled by Rabbi Nasi as a teacher's handbook to prevent it from being forgotten. Okay, uh, very good. And um, what do we mean by Masechta? What it's is it? A tractate. It was... Tractate, it's yes. And what is a tractate? Tractate, for... and this is one of yeah. them. Yeah, good. What's a more commonly used word for tractate? Because no one really says tractate other than like when they're talking about divisions, volumes. Yeah, volumes. Okay, good. Right. So this is one of the divisions of Shas, which is the six uh, orders of the Mishnah. Okay. Um, so this is part of the entire Mishnayos, and then we call each unit a, a Mishnah. Okay. Like our Torah Shabbat video. Uh, <laughs> our beloved Torah Shabbat uh, Peh video. Um, what was I going to say, though? Um, oh, yeah. So that's why when we're learning these individual statements, I think students have a common habit of calling it a Pasuk, but Pasuk is really a unit of Torah Shabbat uh, This we would call a Mishnah. So each statement is called a Mishnah or each paragraph is a Mishnah. Okay. Um, uh, so Emily already answered this question. So when was this published? It was around 200 CE. Okay, that's when the Mishnah was published. All right, good. And then um, the length of this is five actual chapters and then one bonus chapter. And then uh, the bonus chapter is the, yeah, bonus. <laughs> I saw, <laughs> um, uh, it's, they call it Perak Kenyan Torah and it's a combination of Brysos. Anyone remember what a Brysa is? Uh, outside text. Outside text. Yeah. Good. We're not included in the mission. Not included in the mission. Okay, good. So 
same level of authority as the Mishnah, but it was not included in the final thing. Um, and also it's statements of Amoraim. And this was added on sometime much later, which is why you won't find many commentaries written on it uh, by the Rishonim. So I, I don't know, again, I'm not sure exactly why it was added on. I think it had something to do with the Minhag of reading it between the end of Pesach and the beginning of Shavuos. And I guess since there are six weeks from Pesach until Sh from the end of Pesach until Shavuos, then they needed an extra chapter. So like they made one up. Okay. So all, all the statements are legit, but it's not actually part of the Mishnah. Okay. Okay. So now what we're going to do is like this is uh, we're going to do a soaps. Okay. Um, and the way we're going to do it is there are obviously many different commentaries on Pirkei Avos. Um, the one I found the most benefit from is the Rambam. So I have two excerpts from introductions uh, to Pirkei Avos uh, that we're going to read through. And we're going to read through the entire thing. And then we're going to go back and answer uh, soaps based on that. Okay. So we'll read and discuss it. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll go back to this at the very end instead of doing it as we go. Okay, so first part is in his introduction to the Mishnah. Uh, could someone please read in English? Um, okay. Once Rabbi Yehuda Nasi completed everything that the judges need, he began with Avos. Oh, so let me let me uh, fill you in on some background here for one second. Sorry. So what the Ramam is doing is he's explaining why the different Masechtos are put in this order. Okay, and so this. Pirkei Avos comes after a bunch of Masechtos that have to do with, uh, with judges. So you have Sanhedrin, and then you have Shavuos, which is about, Sanhedrin is about the court. Shavuos is about oaths that the judges would have to make people take. And then Makos, which, which was about um, uh, whiplashes, and then, uh, and then Avos. So that's what Rama means when he says, after completing everything that the judges need, then Rabbi Hudanasi went on to Avos. Okay, go ahead, Leah. Okay. Um, he began with Avos. He did this for two reasons. The first is to is the first is in order to inform us of the truth of the oral transmission and the correctness of the tradition transmitted from generation cohort to generation cohort. Yeah, you know what a cohort is. So a cohort, a cohort is a fancy name for a group of people in one generation. So, for example, like people use it. Let's say, for example. Um, Let's say like when, when shall have it existed, <laughs> um, like there's the grades, but then like I consider it to be like a cohort, like all of the students that were in the school from like 2019 to 2020, like that whole like group. So it's not just one generation. It's like an entire generational. In other words, it's not like a generation like father, son, father, son. It's like all the people who were around in a certain time period. And the reason why I translated it as that is because the Masora was not passed down from one person to another. It was passed down from like an entire generation of teachers to an entire generation of students. So um, that's what I mean by generational cohort. Okay, uh, go ahead, Leah. Okay, so therefore it is proper to honor the wise man and to place him in an honorable position because it is his bearer of the tradition. Because he is it a is bearer of the tradition, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, good. So in your own words, not Leah, this question for everyone, in your own words, what is the reason for why uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi put Avos after the stuff about the judges. What was his first purpose? Just to tell us, like, that why, like, what he just said is true, and right. the whole oral tradition. Okay, good. And and based on what we said earlier in class, how is he doing that through Pirkei Avos? Um, he's like quoting them by, sh like by quoting them, he's showing like what good ethical people they were. Okay, good. So he, Ron was actually going to say the ethical part later on, but there's a more basic thing uh, that we saw about the structure of Pirke Alvos, like the information that it gives us. It's literally showing us step by step how yeah. it came. It's literally showing like who passed it down to who. Okay. So so even though he's only doing this for the generation of the Tanayim, for the sages of the Mishnah, really from the Anshe Knesset and forward, he is showing that there was a continual transmission from generation to generation, and he's like listing all the people's names. Okay. Then he says what Ayala just came up with on her own. Okay. Um, uh, Leah, can you continue reading? Yeah, sure. Okay. The second reason is to teach us through this tractate the ethics of each of the sages, so that we may learn from them the best character traits. Judges are in 
greater need of these than any other people. For if ordinary people do not learn Musar, no harm is done to the multitudes, but only to those people themselves. However, if a judge is not ethical and disciplined, he would be harmful and also harm the people with his damaging behavior. Yeah. Okay, good. So before we move on, um, Musar has a lot of different meanings. How would you translate Musar into English? I think there's like two like general definitions that people use for Musar. Rebuke. Rebuke. Okay, so one is rebuke. That's when people say, for example, that you're giving Musser. And then if if Musser is if Musser is a title of like a subject, like like halacha is law and chumash is Bible, how would you translate Musser as like a subject that's studied? Discipline. Okay, good. The, the literal translation is discipline. Yeah, but like if you said uh, I'm studying discipline in school, like what 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 do you, what do you mean by that? <laughs> like if you took a college class that was titled Musser, but it was in English, what would they call it? Character perfection. Okay, good. Character perfection. Yeah. I, 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 would, I, I would say either character development, ethics, you know, um, behavior. Okay. So that's what it means by Musser. Now, so now what he's saying is what, what Ayala said is that this is showing the a different aspect of how the Masorah was passed down, that each of the people who passed it down had good Midos. But then the Rambam adds and says that, uh, that judges need this more than other people. Um, so what, what, do you, what does he mean when he says that if a judge is not ethical and disciplined, then he would be harmed and he would harm other people. But if the ordinary person is, uh, doesn't have Musr, then like, it's not going to harm people. Like, what, what, what is, in your own words, what does the Rambam mean by that? Like he makes it seem like ordinary people don't need to learn Musser, but that's clearly not true because we, we hold that everyone should learn Musser. So what exactly is he saying here? Because the judges not only like have control in their own lives, but they can they also have like a lot of say in other people's lives. Okay, good. So it's extra important that they know it. Okay, exactly. So I think what I was saying is true is that it has to do with their position of authority and or leadership that if you have bad mitos, so then the most people you're going to affect are you and like your friends and your family. But a judge has tremendous power over the community. So if he has bad mitos, it's going to affect lots of people. And not only is it going to affect them in terms of him being corrupt, like in other words, not only is it, let's say like a, a judge takes bribes or something. So that'll definitely affect people in a bad way. But how else might it affect people, uh, you know, more than the average person? Their judgment will be based on it. So their judgment is going to be based on. It. Let's say, let's say he has. Let's say outside of the court cases, how might his bad meals affect people? Hint is think about like the other role judges played other than like giving judgments. Well, he's a leader in society, and people look up to him. Exactly, is that they're role models and leaders, and so people will will look to their leader for uh, emulation of their behavior, you know, to, to emulate their behavior. Okay. All right. So this is the Ramam's first introduction. We're going to read two more things and then we're going to go back to the soapstone. Okay. And fill it or soap and fill it in. Uh, could, who else wants to read? Emily, you want to read? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, the this, by the way, this is, let me explain where this is from first. Sorry. Uh, this is from, so Ramam wrote a commentary on the whole Mishnah and then he wrote a, introduction to Pirkei Avos called Shmona Prakim, the eight chapters. And then he wrote an introduction to Shmona Prakim. So this is like his introduction to his introduction to Pirkei Avos. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Emily. Um, the sages peace upon them have already said, whoever wishes to be a chassid should fulfill the words of Pirkei Avos. Okay, pause for one second. Okay. What is a chassid in this context? A wise person. A uh, wise person we call chacham. Okay. Uh, Oh, a good Mida person, like a... Okay, yeah. so it's a good, a good Mida person. All right, that, that, that's a, it's a good translation. No, it's a good, it's a good translation. Uh, anyone know the... the uh, I don't like the English term for it, but there is an English term that's, that's usually used for Chassid. Anyone know? Starts with a P. Philanthropist, I don't know. Uh, philanthropist is actually not a bad translation um, because it, if you say it comes from the word Chesed, then that, that would suggest someone who's very giving. So the English word is used for pi, is pious, P-I-O-U-S, uh, which means, which I don't really like because it has a very religious implication as opposed to the way that it's used here is ethical, you know? So the, the best definition I think of, um, 
Hasid, other than what Emily said of being a good Midos person, is, uh, is Avram ben Ramam gives this definition. It's someone who goes beyond the letter of the law. Okay. In other words, halacha requires that you do certain things. A Hasid is someone who does all of their, like keeps halacha, but goes beyond to do even more than what halacha demands. Okay. The word chesed literally means extra or excess. Okay. And this is not to be confused with Hasid, like the Hasidic movement started by the Baal Shem Tov in the 18th century. Okay. That in English would be like with a capital C. Okay. This is like a, a, a certain level of, of perfection. Okay. So whenever you see Hasid, it means in, in Pirkei Avos, it'll mean someone who goes beyond the letter of the law. And then whenever you see Hasidus, it means like the type of Midos development that takes you beyond the letter of the law. Um, I always think though that pious has like a negative connotation, like you're above everyone else. Like um, it has, I think it has negative because uh, a negative connotation when people accuse someone of like exhibiting pious behavior, like you're acting like super religious. But in strictly speaking, it's it's a positive connotation. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have no level higher than Hasidus, except for prophecy and. Hasidus is what brings one to prophecy. As they said, Hasidus brings a person to Ruch HaKodesh. It is clear from their words that living by the ethical teachings of the tractate brings a person to prophecy, since the tractate includes a great portion of char good character traits. Okay. All right. So now we've read a little bit of the intro, and we are ready to fill out our soaps. Okay. And by the way, the reason why uh, I didn't put tone, this is not soap stone, is because each of the statements has its own tone, so there's no point in, like, saying what the tone is. Okay, so I have a question yes. on around what you just yeah, said. So you said that there's no level higher except for Nivua. So what about like a Talmud Chacham or a Tzaddik or any of those stuff? Yeah, um, you mean in terms of how they how Talmud Chacham or Tzaddik relates to Hasidus? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like there are levels higher. No. Well, okay. So let me let me just quickly let me um, do one thing here. Just one second. I just have to find this document on my computer. So this is from, I'm pretty sure if you were in my Mishlei class, I showed you this. Oh, hold on just one second. New share. Did we do, those who were in my Mishlei class, uh, yeah, we did this, the Mishlei spectrum? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, so, I saw the chart. This is, this is nice. This is my uh, understanding of the different levels. Um, and uh, there are some people, you know, there are people who disagree about where exactly you should place it. But if you look here, so the middle is Na'ar, who's like the, uh, the youth is the, some, the person who's uh, like, you know, neutral or like blank slate. Chacham is higher than that. Sadiq is higher than that. And then Hasid is higher than Mishle. Okay. And I mentioned that in Mishle, I don't think there is any Pasuk. I'm trying to remember if there's any, I don't think there's any Pasuk that says Hasid. And there are only three Pasukim, I think, that even mention Chesed. All right. Um, and then beyond that, the Ramam is saying is Ruach HaKodesh or Nevuah. So to answer Ayala's question, um, there are different levels, but according to my understanding of Shlomo and according to the Rambam, who was quoting Chazal, Chasid is like the top, top, top beneath Nivua. So no one is really higher than the Chasid except for the Navi. And then there are different levels below. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, not everyone agrees with that. Like you'll, you, you might find in different contexts that there are different people who disagree, but Rambam is talking about the context of, uh, of his understanding of, uh, of that Chazal. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. but according to Rollam's definition of a chassid, yeah. I feel like it's kind of a problem to say that in general, it's a good thing to add on to the mitzvah. Okay, so this is actually going to take us to a different topic, which I was going to save for not next week, but the week after that, which is like, how do you fit in this type of chassidus with the rest of Torah? Because like Leah said, like you shouldn't add on to mitzvos. So what's the difference between adding on to mitzvos and like doing this? Okay. Excellent question. Um, I think I, I, I'm pretty sure I want to save it for two weeks from now because I want to do a little bit of Pirkei Avos first now that we're like after uh, Sukkot. But uh, I, uh, Blee Netter, we will get to that um, and take it up like uh, over the course of a week. Okay. So uh, we'll hold on to that for now. Okay. So um, 
according to the Rambam, what's the general, general, general subject of Pirkei Avos? Like again, pretend Pirkei Avos is a textbook. So what class would it be a textbook for? Ethics. Ethics. Okay, good. So Musar, uh, which you could translate as ethical perfection, excellence and Midos, character development, however you want to translate it. Okay. Um, trick question. What was the occasion that led to the writing of Pirkei Avos? The danger the that Torah Shemal was being forgotten. Yeah, okay. It's a trick question because it's not specific to Pirkei Avos. It's really the occasion that the Mishnah was written. So this is part of Rabbi Huda Nasi's effort to preserve Torah Shemal Peh, right? It was in danger of being forgotten. And then also from the Rambam's explanation, it sounds like there was another, there were at least two other urgencies that led to Pirkei Avos being, uh, to specifically Pirkei Avos that it needed to be written. Um, Anyone pick up on that? Like, in other words, remember, exigence literally means urgency. So, like, what, what other than, like, general Torah Shemal Peh being forgotten, what was Rabbi Huda Hanasi worried about maybe might happen that led him to, like, make a tractate devoted to Pirkei Avos? Maybe the people of a generation needed, like, their leaders, Musar. Okay, good. So number one is, is apparently there was a danger. I don't know if it was an actual danger or something he was uh, afraid of for like the future that people would need Musser, especially the, the, the judges, right? So that created its own urgency. Okay, that corresponds to his second purpose when he said that, um, that, uh, that people, that judges need ethical perfection. Okay. And then why else did he, what was his other thing that he said um, the first reason he gave about why Pirkei Avos was put after Nazikin that you can infer an exigence from. People were questioning the authority of Torah Shemal Peh. Okay, excellent, good, right? So if you put them all together now, so we have number one, Torah Shemal Peh was in danger of being forgotten. That's why the Mishnah was written in general. Number two, sounds like there was a danger of people losing respect for the Bali Masora or like not trusting their authority. And so to preserve that, he listed the entire Masora in Pirkei Avos, you know, from the, the Tanaim and uh, just through the Tanaim. And number three, sounds like there was either a real danger or a potential, potential danger that the judges would not maintain the level of ethical perfection that they needed for themselves and for the community. So these are the three urgencies that led to the writing of Pirkei Avos. Okay, and I'll point out, by the way, Pirkei Avos, already you can see, Pirkei Avos is different than all of the other Mishnayos because in general, so Pirkei Avos is Musr, in general, what kind of content are you going to find in, in a Mishnah? Halacha. Halacha, right? So Pirkei Avos is the only tractate that in its entirety is devoted to non-halachic topics. Um, okay, so, um, all right. Who is the audience of Pirkei Avos, according to the Ramam? And think immediate that versus generation. Immediate, immediate. Yeah, what do you say, Leah? The immediate is like that generation who needed the, like the, the Pirkei Avos to help guide them. Okay, that's definitely true. He definitely wrote it most, uh, um, what do you call it? Most pressingly for the, that generation because that's when it was in danger of being forgotten. But let's say like he also wrote it Okay, so, okay, you know what, you're, you're right. You could say that immediate is that generation and mediated is future generations, okay? But let's look within, treat like all future generations as one group. Within his entire audience, I think you have people who he's talking to directly, and then there are people who might gain from it who he's not talking to, who, to directly. So who, who is this really made for? Well, it's a teacher's handbook, right? So maybe right. like the leaders and teachers of the generation. Okay, definitely true. Um, what about within Pirkei Avos specifically, not just the Mishnah? And you kind of have to think about the purpose of, of Pirkei Avos in order to get this question. Let me, let me give you a, a let me give you a, Musa? okay. So l let me uh, address uh, Leah's possibility. Leah said people who need Musa, right? So do you remember who Mishle was written for? Anyone who wants to like do practical stuff better. Right. Anyone who wants help for practical decision making. Based on what the Ramam wrote, how is Pirke Alvis different than the audience of Mishle? This is a tricky question. 
Maybe this is just for like people uh, uh, who. I thought I saw Emily first. Yeah, so go ahead, Emily. No? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Go well, um, my movie, the, like this one, is just for the leaders who will then teach those Mido to the students. Okay, good. I think, I, think, I think you're correct. I think you're correct. I, I phrased it slightly differently. Ayala, what were you going to say? That it's just for like the Hasidim or like the people who want to follow Hashem. It's not for like anyone. Okay. Like, all the Rashad and they can't use it. Uh, okay, good, good. So, so I, I, I'm going to say something slightly uh, uh, overlapping what both of you said here. So, um, based on the Raman, at least, okay, um, it's for, first of all, it's for judges, okay, uh, because they need it the most, but also it's for people who are on a high enough level to work on becoming a Hasid, okay? And we mentioned Hasid means going beyond the letter of the law. So, what do you need to do before you learn Pirkei Avos? Get good at the letter. Get good at the letter of the law, right? So, in other words, Mishle is for everybody primarily, okay? Pirkei Avos is primarily for people on a high level. Secondarily, it's for ordinary people like us who can benefit from it, but primarily it's for people who are working on becoming a chassid. So like in Mishle terms, people who are already tzaddikim and they want to go one level higher, or in Pirkei Avos terms, people who are already keeping the mitzvos and want to go one level higher and be a chassid, okay? Um, and so that's one of the purposes of Pirkei Avos is to make you into a chassid. And then the Ram also in, by, inferred when he, he mentioned that there was a higher level than Pirkei Avos, okay? W what's the ultimate purpose of becoming a chassid through Pirkei Avos? To get nevuah. Get nevuah, okay, right? So, um, so become a chassid is purpose number one. Purpose two is to prepare people for nevuah, okay? And then three, I actually forgot that I added this last minute here, okay, is to reinforce the ethos, okay, of the Bali Masora to strengthen the authority of Torah's Pad, both by charting out who got the Torah from who, and then also by showing that these were good people with, with, uh, with uh, you know, virtuous uh, characters, okay? Um, so that's, uh, those are the three purposes of Pirkei Avos. Now, we know from doing rhetorical analysis in English that um, the purpose and the audience can affect the, the way that the author intended for it to be read. So what's the, what are we going to have to do based on the audience and purpose when we read Pirkei Avos? Like what's, no, let me back that up for a second. What's the difference between what we're going to have to do when we read this book versus when we read Mishle or Chumash? See how it's going beyond the letter of the law? Yeah. So number one, we're going to have to see how, where is the letter of the law and how is this going beyond the letter of the law? Good. And then in application, what are we going to have to do when we read this? Realize that it's going to be really hard for us because we're like not close to that level. Exactly. So what we're going to have to do is we're, is we're going to have to not immediately try to implement this, but think to ourselves, okay, what parts of this can we uh, like, can we take on our level? And then what parts of this are like for the people who are working on becoming a uh, Hasid? Okay. Um, so that's just something we're going to have to keep in mind and that will come up when we, when we learn Pirkei Avos. Okay. Now I mentioned this is only according to the Rambam who uh, that we're doing right now. Um, there are some who, I think everyone holds that the first Pirkei of Pirkei Avos is for judges and maybe the second, but there are, there are people who hold that later parts of Pirkei Avos are for everybody. And I guess when we get there, we're going to have to assess on our own, whether we think this is for people who are on a high level or, or for general audiences. Okay. But for now, when we're doing chapters one and two, we'll assume it's for judges. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Okay. Now, uh, speaker, the Rambam did not directly answer that, but we kind of answered that when we were talking about Pirkei Avos in general. So who is the speaker of Pirkei Avos? This is another trick question. Rabbi Huda, <laughs> not really. Uh, no, actually. He's the compiler, but he's not the speaker. Ooh. So the Amoran the, yes, the Tanaim, the individual Tanaim who were in charge of Torah Shabbat Peh that are mentioned here, okay? And the persona that they took on is really based on each of the statements, okay? In other words, ordinarily in the Gemara or the Mishnah, you'll find it'll say, for example, like Rabbi Akiva Omer. In Pirkei Avos, it'll often say like Rabbi, you know, um, Rabbi, it'll say like Hillel Haya Omer. He used to say. And used to say means that this is like something that was like his motto or his, his, uh, his, his saying, you know? So, so each persona kind of comes through in the quotation that was chosen for them. You know, for example, like when you see someone who said, um, 
like, um, I always got these mixed up. I, I think this was Shammai that he said that you should be the first to greet every person. Someone said you should be the first to greet every person. Someone else said you should greet everyone with a smiling face. And I forgot who said what, but like the fact that that was like their motto conveys a certain persona that they were very, um, that they cared a lot about like, you know, creating good social interactions, you know? So the, the persona comes through in, in the, the statements that were chosen for them. Okay. Um, so this is our intro to Pirkei Avos. Any questions? Okay. Um, so uh, we have about seven minutes left of class. I'm not gonna turn the sh screen sharing off because like I said before, the screen sharing is what prevents your faces from being recorded on the video. So uh, we'll keep this up also if people wanna take notes. But uh, anyone have any other questions that came up over Sukkis? Yeah, Ayala. I, I, I can't, it's funny, I, I said I can't see if you, I, you raise your hand. I can only see the people who are currently displayed and those are the people who are currently talking. So feel free to like jump in. I can't see everyone. Well, actually, what I could put on, on grid view now. Yeah, Ayala, you had a question? Yeah, so this is like a follow up on my other question about sure. free will and yeah. how it could be punished for that stuff. So I asked my dad also, and- Can you, can you remind me the, uh, the question was, if let me, I'll see if I can remember the question. The question was, if um, if most people are not making free will decisions in their day, like most people are just acting based on their personality or their upbringing or their character, so then how can they be punished for those um, those decisions? Is that was that the question? Yeah. Okay, and yeah. Think, remind me what I answered. I think I answered that um, because a person can choose to change their path that they're on, then like the path that you're on is the result of your free will decisions, even if the particular decisions are not in every case. Was that my answer or was that, did I uh -oh. answer? Okay, then I may have misunderstood you. I may have given um, a different answer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't record that session, so I can't say, I can't check it. <laughs> Well, I thought you said was that there are two different types of free will. Mm. Like you showed the Ramam's two different types. One of them is like life changing decisions, I guess. And one of them is just like day to day, every single thing that you do. Okay. So you're punished based on the day to day, every single thing that you do. And you did, you did mention that like you can change it, but I didn't think that was the main idea. Or could be, I just miss. Okay. Either way. Yeah. So what, what did your dad say? Um, he gave me a different answer. Okay. He said pretty much that like you can't, not every decision is free will and like you're not being punished. Like, first of all, there are two different types of punishments. If you're talking about like bait din, then just based, you're not being punished like because of you, you're being punished because you're going to be a harm to society. Uh -huh. So then you can be punished. Uh -huh. And if it's not bait din, then like every decision you make, you have to look at as if it is free will, even though it's true, they're not, they may not all be. But if you think about a decision not being free will, then you're kind of making it into a free will decision, I think. Interesting. Huh. And like you have to act as if every decision is free will because like otherwise, I guess. I mean, you Wait, just have you to. Make it into, if you say to yourself, this is not a free will decision, you're making it free will? Like if you say like, oh, this decision may not be free will, so I won't do it. So like I don't, so I, like let's say I shake the lulav. You could be like, oh, this isn't free will, I'm just doing it or whatever, so I won't get punished, therefore I won't do it. Then that's kind of making right. it into... In other words, if you use the lack of free will as a r rationalization for your actions, so then that itself is like a, uh, a decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But on your, like, what I understood from what you said last time, my dad pointed out, and like, I also am wondering... If you're saying that both, there are like two different types of free will, then how exactly were you defining like free will? And like, in what sense is the day-to-day -day decisions free will? Right. Yeah. So um, let me um, let me think for one second here. Because I'm, I'm trying to separate the way I answered your question from uh, then to the way from the way I answered it now. So based on what I said then, I believe I, I think I showed you the Rambam that says like even the decision to stand up or sit down is free will, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that just means that you are, uh, for lack of a better term, you are 
controlling what you do. Okay. That's not a, for lack of a better term, that's not like a philosophical free will decision. That's like a, unlike a uh, bacterium that just like reacts based on its, the way it's like programmed or like a plant, you know, that plants will like naturally like go towards the sunlight. You can control your individual actions. So that was the individual, that was the individual free will. And then that was the one I did define. And then the free will of your path, I didn't define but what I would say now, based on what I meant then, <laughs> is that um, basically every person has two, that there's part of you that can perceive re objective reality and what is objectively good and objectively bad. And then there's a part of you that can, um, that operates based on imagination or based on fantasy or based on fears that don't correspond to reality, uh, like fantasies and fears that don't correspond to reality. So when you follow that part of yourself that can perceive objective reality. That's one choice. And when you block off objective reality and give in to this imaginary fantasy based view of reality and act based on that or think based on that, that's like another type of free will decision. And so what, that's what I meant by like the two paths that you're on. Uh, and so, and those two parts of you are always there. Um, and obviously you, it's possible to go so far down the road of fantasy that you can no longer see reality, in which case I don't think that would be a free will decision. And theoretically, you can go so far down the path of reality that you wouldn't be able to go the other way either. But like, I think only Moshe Rabbeinu like got to a level like that where like the Raman says he's only like a Moloch. So practically that's not something you should be concerned about. <laughs> um, but is that, uh, so th that's how I would define free will there is basically choosing to follow your Yitzir HaTov, which is the inclination towards reality and objective good or your to hurrah, which is the inclination towards blocking off reality or towards fantasy. Mm -hmm. That makes that sense. Enter that part of your question. Yeah, pretty much. But the first type of like whatever control over your decisions. Yeah. So animals have that too, right? Right. Um, uh, higher animals do. Yeah. Lower animals do not. Uh, and I don't know where right. to draw the line, but yeah. Yeah. That would just be okay. like one zone. Yeah. So it's not like free will in a sense. Okay, yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, that good. Uh, we, we only have 10 seconds left, but in 10 seconds, I want to ask a question on your what your dad said, which is, or on what your understanding of what your dad said is, is that the thing about like how you have to think of it, that is a good explanation for like how we should live. I don't think it solves God, the God, God's justice problem entirely. I, that's what I sense. Like in the case you mentioned, then it does. But uh, I have to think about it more in terms of like God's justice. Okay, but let, let's leave that for a future discussion. All right. Uh, have a good day, everybody. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.